This is the American Forces Vietnam Network. The Chi Hoi program is very vital. It serves an important mission, the encouragement of Viet Cong to come over to our side. Not only does this mean less resistance on the battlefield, but also yields important information about the enemy. It's been a very successful program. Many American lives have been saved by the continuing efforts of the Chu Hoi program. May 1971. From when I went in, you didn't have much of a drug problem, but when I got out, I think there was more of a big drug problem, uh, especially those going into Vietnam. They had easy access to it. Um, I know the, very, the Navy was very strict if you were caught uh, dealing in drugs and things like that. But I, I said I saw it more when I was getting out of the Navy than going into the Navy. The guys that you were with all the while, you had no problem with. You know, we had everybody's back. But a lot of new guys that were coming in, and there was drugs, a lot of drugs were starting to happen. And, uh, you know, we just things were starting to change a lot and I was kind of glad that I got out of there when I did you know I, and reading about it and hearing it on the news at night after I got home was boy I'm glad I wasn't there then <laughs> Congressman Robert Steele of Connecticut and Morgan Murphy of Illinois returned from a visit to Vietnam with a startling claim 15 percent of all servicemen there are addicted to heroin even though the military decreases that figure to 2%, Richard Nixon does not take it lightly. He had earlier submitted legislation for reform of federal drug enforcement. And on June 17, 1971, he asks for 155 million more for domestic programs. President Nixon's plan for $14 million is to increase the Veteran Administration's budget to establish testing stations and rehabilitation in Vietnam. Soldiers are now required to test for heroin use before returning home. Nearly 20% self-identify as heroin addicts, while a stunning 45% of all soldiers are revealed to have used opium or heroin at least once. Drug use was an escape from a living nightmare, and one that threatens to create more nightmares for the servicemen in Vietnam. President Nixon continues to struggle back at home. He must live up to his campaign promise to end the war. However, the media continues to criticize the war in Vietnam, while Nixon takes whatever measures possible to end it. It becomes a vicious cycle. Once secret actions, such as the earlier bombing of Cambodia, are found out, they receive media criticism and drive a further wedge between the president and the public. An atmosphere of distrust surrounds the government. Soon, it all goes to hell. What are the Pentagon Papers? They are a secret study began per the Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, in 1967 without the knowledge of President Johnson. Researched and written by academics, civilian employees, and military officers, the report of the Office of the Secretary of Defense, Vietnam Task Force, documents United States involvement in Vietnam from 1945 to 1967. Parts of it are leaked by an analyst who himself opposes the war, former Marine Corps officer Daniel Ellsberg. In March 1971, he provides secret photocopies to the New York Times, a research that encompasses 47 volumes and 3,000 pages of narrative. Revealed in the papers are the covert activities from the past four administrations. Truman's aid to the French against Viet Minh. Eisenhower's undermining of North Vietnam and helping Diem take over. Kennedy's elevation to making Vietnam a commitment and allowing the generals to overthrow and assassinate Diem. The real reason for the United States bombing of North Vietnam in 1965. It was an attempt to contain China and prevent them 
from organizing all Asian countries into a third world war. Also revealed is the government's planned provocation during the Johnson administration of North Vietnam to launch a major strike to justify American intervention. The Gulf of Tonkin had provided just that. The war in Vietnam appears planned from the start, with motivations different from those communicated to the American people. The U.S. Department of Justice gets a restraining order against publication after three installments have been printed. Both the Times and Washington Post take the matter to court and on June 30th win a 6-3 to three Supreme Court victory as the court recognizes the paper's First Amendment rights. Denied their legal victory, the Nixon administration charges Ellsberg and an apparent accomplice on criminal charges in 1973. Ellsberg surrenders himself to authorities and a grand jury indicts him on stealing and holding secret documents. A mistrial is called, however, when it is revealed that a covert White House team called the Plumbers burglarized the office of Ellsberg's psychiatrist in September 1971. The two men, E. Howard Hunt and G. Gordon Liddy, will eventually lead to Nixon's downfall. Over in Paris, France, the preliminary peace talks between Henry Kissinger and North Vietnamese negotiator Li Duc Tho are stalling. That is, around the conference table. Kissinger engages Tho in secretive peace talks of their own outside the boundaries of Paris. Nixon wants the war over, especially as he faces a re-election year. North Vietnam wants freedom to keep troops of their own in South Vietnam as well as an end to the Americans' bombing. But North Vietnam is determined to gain more leverage in negotiations, and their method of taking it is unprecedented. March 20th, 1972. With American forces diminished to only 69,000 in South Vietnam, the North Vietnamese decide to strike while their opponents are at their weakest and least defended. Their plan is designed to overtake the South Vietnamese by sheer brute force and gain more territory. Their armament is boosted by Soviet and Chinese aid, providing a total of 400 tanks for ground superiority over the South Vietnamese. The Easter Offensive begins at noon with the North Vietnamese attacking South Vietnam through three fronts with heavy tanks and artillery units. They cross the demilitarized zone and Laotian border. The attack is also a test of Nixon and his policy of Vietnamization, when he's at his most politically vulnerable. Two North Vietnamese divisions, a total of about 30,000 troops, cross the DMZ into the northern area of South Vietnam. Three South Vietnamese divisions are taken by surprise and quickly overwhelmed. Only one division is experienced, while two are no older than six months. They are also attacked while two divisions are exchanging positions and are quickly overwhelmed. Many of the inexperienced South Vietnamese troops run for cover rather than stay behind their artillery to hold the enemy. The NVA divisions drive south towards Quang Tri, located just north of decimated city of Hue. Another division attacks from the west, out of Laos, and toward the Quang Tri River Valley. The North Vietnamese cleverly time their offensive for the seasonal monsoon, which provides cloud cover that makes airstrikes by U.S. forces practically impossible. To make matters worse, Many South Vietnamese forces are either inexperienced or inept. Camp Carroll, a base standing between the North Vietnamese forces and Quang Tri City and boasting 1,500 troops, is surrendered, with hardly any shots fired. Another base, Mai Lok, is also abandoned. The South Vietnamese that do counterattack are unable to stop 
the North Vietnamese juggernaut from rolling over them or forcing them, along with civilians, to flee. North Vietnamese forces gain Quang Tri City on May 2nd. But the South Vietnamese will have their day in the city of An Lok. Located between Saigon and a basin in Cambodia, the North Vietnamese value An Lok's strategic importance. On April 8, 1972, the North Vietnamese decimate Lok Ninh, a small town 20 miles north of An Lok. As over 35,000 troops converge on the city, South Vietnamese forces anticipate the invasion and, at about only 7,500 strong and cut off by enemy forces, know that they must make a stand. The North Vietnamese arrive on April 13th but find themselves unable to break into the city, held at bay by the South Vietnamese. On April 19th, the U.S. Air Force is able to intervene with air support. When enemy forces push for an all-out assault on the city on May 11th, they face determined South Vietnamese troops, as well as bombing by several B-52s. Their final attempt is on May 12th, but that too is stopped as the South Vietnamese troopers now benefit from reinforcements. 66 days after it begins on June 18th, the Battle of An Lok is over. For South Vietnam, it is a victory and won through the intervention of American air power. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, Please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.